thank you very much to the uh, Sunco Singers. It was a beautiful song. It is My Father's World, and of course it is uh, Father's Day weekend, I believe. So uh, that's uh, appropriate for our time, and today we're going to be looking at one of the most famous fathers in the Bible. Not always a perfect father, but a, ma a father of the faithful, and that is Abraham himself. So uh, good morning, everybody. We'd like to welcome you to our worship service here on this beautiful Michigan summer day. Uh, for those of you joining us online, we give you a warm welcome as well. Um, I've been struggling with my voice the last sort of six or seven weeks. It disappeared from me in Wichita, Kansas, um, for which I always have a fond spot in my memory, Wichita, Kansas, where I lost my voice. So I'm going to be drinking through my sermon today because it's slowly coming back. I just hope I can make it through our two sermons today. And we have two, two, two different sermons today. Uh, they're on different names of God. Uh, the first is in the story of uh, Hagar and Abraham, and the second service I'll be speaking about um, the battle with the Amalekites in the book of Exodus, and there's another name of God revealed there by Moses. Uh, but our first, uh, our first uh, sermon today is, taught, is entitled, The God Who Sees, and um, <clears throat> there it hasn't come through on the PowerPoint, but it's Elroy, The God Who Sees. And that is the name of God that we're going to be exploring today for our first service. So um, I invite you to bow your heads with me, and we'll ask the Holy Spirit to guide our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Father, I thank you that the sun is shining, the birds are singing, the, air, the sky is blue, the grass is green, and I thank you that we have the freedom to gather and worship you here today. Lord, as I share from your word, I pray that your spirit will speak through me and for me. I ask that my voice will hold out. And I pray, Lord, that the God who sees, that you will see into each of our hearts, and you will lead us, and you will change us, and you will guide us. We ask you this mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if I were to ask you, first of all, are names important? I think you would say yes, yes. Uh, oftentimes, your name can determine your experience of life. So uh, I was once stopped by a police officer in some other part of the world, and he wanted to know my name uh, because he and I had a dispute about how fast I was going. So he wanted to know my name and address, and I said, my name is Charles Windsor, and my, name, my address is Buckingham Palace. And I said, this obviously is a joke, and he didn't realize it was a joke. But if my name really were to be Charles Windsor, um, I would probably not be standing here today. I'd be the Prince of Wales in England. Another policeman stopped me and wanted to know my name and address for, I think, the same reason. And I explained that my name was Michael Mouse and my address was Sunset Boulevard, Hollywood. And again, he didn't see the humor in that. Um, but again, your name does have a meaning. It does impact your name, your life experience. There were some English kings. I'll give you some of their names. There was a guy called Ethelred the Unready. Is it a good idea to have a king whose name is Ethelred the Unready? Probably not. There was a king called Alfred the Great, and he kicked the Danes out of the eastern half of England, so he's known as the Great. The guy who built Westminster Abbey in about 1000 AD, that's 1100 years ago, he is known in, to history as Edward the Confessor, because he spent so much time in the confessional, and he, laid, he built what we now call um, Westminster Abbey. Then there was a king called Edgar the Peaceable, and he didn't last very long, uh, because such were the nature of the days in which he lived. So Edgar the Peaceable is not a good name for a king, Rather, there was another king called William the Conqueror, and he invaded England. He was the Duke of Normandy. He invaded England in 1066 AD, and that starts off modern British history. He was known as William the Conqueror, and he took the first census of the English people, and it is known to history as the Doomsday Book. You can still read it. Um, there was another king called Richard Coeur de Lion, or Richard the Lionheart, very famous king. Um, he was a king for 10 years. He stayed in England for three years, raised enough money, went off on a crusade. Uh, captured Jerusalem from the, the, uh, the Muslims, and uh, on his way home, um, he was captured by a French count and uh, held hostage. And so the English exchequer had to raise twice the national GDP to ransom him, and he, when he was ransomed, he came out and decided to sack the next French castle he came across, and in the process of sacking that castle, was hit in the neck by a crossbow bolt and never made it home. Now, he was followed by a guy called John Lackland, he was the guy who signed the Magna Carta, and he was known as the Lackland because he had no land. And what good is a king if you don't own land? And so we hired foreign mercenaries, and hence we have the Magna Carta today. So names reflect their character. Now, in the Bible, names also change in, in tune with people's spiritual experience. So we have uh, Jacob. What does Jacob become? 
Israel. So Jacob means the deceiver, and he becomes Israel, which means the prince of God. You see his spiritual experience uh, through the change of his name. You also have Saul, and Saul becomes Paul, uh, maybe after Paulus, his first convert, the Roman governor of Cyprus. Uh, then you have Abraham, who we're going to be looking at today. He becomes who? Abraham. And Sarai becomes Sarah. And Simon becomes Peter in the New Testament. And so, uh, names reflect, the, the change of name reflects people's uh, spiritual growth, the change in their spiritual experience. And according to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, when we get to heaven, each one of us gets a new name written by God alone, which reflects our unique spiritual experience in life. Aren't you looking forward to seeing what your name might become when you get to heaven? It'll be a name of honor, a name given you by God Himself. Now, God has many names, each of which is a window into understanding His character. And so we find in Genesis 17, Abraham God calls God El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. Uh, in uh, Genesis 22, which is the story of Abraham going to offer si um, Isaac um, on the Mount of Moriah, um, Abraham calls God Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Ireh, which means the Lord will provide. And then um, the Lord who heals is in Exodus chapter 15 when they cross the Red Sea. And then you have Kadosh Israel, the Holy One of Israel. We find that in Leviticus 19. Uh, David calls God Yahweh Roy, the Lord my shepherd. And then Jeremiah refers to God as Yahweh Tzidkanu, which means the Lord our righteousness. These are all beautiful names of God, but today we're going to be looking at uh, a very, well, uh, the, uh, this particular name of God. It means the God who sees, or the God who sees me and hears me in my distress. That's what the name means. And so every good um, story has three basic components. Whether you, whether you read a Charlotte Bronte novel or Charles Dickens or any famous American authors or wherever you come from, or whether you watch any movie, every story has three basic components. So there's a situation followed by a complication, then there's a resolution. And if you think of every movie you've ever seen, every novel you've ever read, they basically have these three components. Would you agree with me? There's a situation, there's a complication, and then there's a resolution. And most of the time, let's say when it comes to movies, the situation is like you get a, a happy couple or a happy family lasting about 30 seconds, then you have the complication, and then most of the movie is the resolution of that family's problems. And you find the same structure throughout the Scriptures. Uh, so, for instance, the book of Ruth. Um, it's, uh, Ruth uh, is really the story of the, the, the resolution of Naomi's problems, not of Ruth's problems. Uh, really, Naomi is the hero of the book of Ruth. And so, uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, this story of Hagar um, that is found in the book of Genesis chapter 16. So, we're going to start looking at the situation. I'm going to put the text up on the screen. You can read them in your Bibles if you want. Um, but we're going to start out the story in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4. Now, this is the second time that we find the call of God to Abraham. The first time that we find the, God, the call of God to Abraham is actually in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 7, verses 2, 3, and 4, where God called Abraham to leave his country and his kindred, um, to leave Ur of the Chaldees and come to the Promised Land. But on his way to the Promised Land, Abraham gets stuck in Haran, which is a northern-day Iraq. And so he's journeying from the Persian Gulf all the way around the river Tigris and Euphrates. He gets stuck in Haran because his father is old and can't go on any further, and he waits till his father is dead, and then God reaffirms his call to Abraham. And this is the call here. It says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed." So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from, uh, from Haram. And so when, fa when um, Abraham's father has died, um, Abraham moves on from Haram, and he's moving on to the Promised Land. He's 75 years old at the time, and he has no children, and his wife's about 10 years younger than him. So they are both approaching kind of like the upper, upper limits of the envelope, like when you can actually realistically have children. But God promises him that he is going to make, make a great nation out of him. So Abraham isn't quite sure how God is going to fulfill this promise. So let me ask you the question. God says to Abraham in the first verse there, go from your country and from your kindred. 
So the question is, in the last verse there, you see on the screen, did Abraham fully obey God? Did Abraham first of all leave his country? Yes, he did. Now, did, they, did Abraham leave all his kindred? No. Who did he take with him on this journey? Lot, the next generation down, his nephew. Because Abraham suspects he's not going to have any children naturally. He suspects his wife is beyond childbearing age, and she surely suspects that. And so even though Abraham um, is partially obedient to God and he leaves his father's country, he doesn't exactly leave all his family behind. He takes a man of the next generation who he thinks will maybe be his, his, the, the chosen seed, the chosen successor. So Abraham ent- heads out from Haran on his way to the promised land. Now, a year, um, a year later, in Genesis 15, Abraham and Sarah are still childless. But in Genesis 15, Abraham tells God that actually my chosen heir is not going to be Lot, and it's not the child of promise, so I don't have one yet. It's going to be a man called Eliezer. Eliezer was a slave born in his household, and um, he was going to be the chosen heir of Abraham. So Abraham, so far, he's, he's, he's hedging his bets with God. Okay, um, God's going to make of me a great nation. So he takes Lot with him. Maybe Lot will be the, cho- the child of promise. Then in Genesis 15, Eliezer pops up as the chosen heir of Abraham, but that's not God's plan for Abraham. And so at the end of Genesis chapter 15, God reaffirms his promise to Abraham that it's not going to be Lot who will be your heir, and it's not going to be Eliezer. I still am going to give you a child of promise. But Abraham's not quite sure that God's going to come through on his promises. So he's hedging his bets. Is it going to be Eliezer? Maybe it's going to be Lot. So then we come to our scripture reading. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bore him no children. This is immediately after, in Genesis 15, God promises Abraham, you're going to have a child. And Sarah's your wife. And Genesis 16 starts with the, good news, the bad news that Sarai was not bearing him any children. But she had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And so here we have the complication. And uh, as you look through the story of Abraham, before we get to Isaac, you have Lot, then you have Eliezer, then you have Ishmael, and Abraham on each occasion thinks maybe this is the one through whom the child of promise will, will the, through whom the, the seed, the line of promise will come. Will God have fulfilled his promises through Lot? The answer is no. Will he fulfill his promises through Eliezer? No. Will God fulfill his promises through Ishmael? No. And so Abraham is kind of hedging his bets with God here. And in this first verse, um, you see that, that Abraham is stuck between two warring women. It literally starts out with Sarai, and it ends up with Hagar, that verse 1 in the Hebrew, and stuck in the middle is Abram. And Abram is stuck between two competing, warring women. It's not a good omen for the story that's about to take place. There's a story of two women here. One is old, the other is young. One is fertile, the other is past childbearing years. One is free, the other is a slave. One is an Iraqi, that's Sarah. One is an Egyptian, that's Hagar. One has a position of authority, and the other is in a position of subservience. And yet this verse begins with Sarah and ends with Hagar, and stuck in the middle between these two competing women, we find Abram. And Genesis 16 starts with the idea that time is moving on, because it says there in verse 3, after Abraham had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan. So 10 years after God has reiterated his promise to Abraham, well, I'm going to bless you, and you're going to have many, many children, you have many descendants, the promise is still not coming, not coming true, and Father Time and Mother Nature are brutal um, taskmasters, and Sarah knows that she's not going to have any children, that's what she thinks. And so she decides to take matters into her own hands. Now, you may ask yourself, where did this Hagar come from? Well, in Genesis 12, a few chapters before, uh, when Abraham went down to Egypt, he was afraid for his life because he said that his wife was beautiful. And he said to her, tell everybody that you're my sister and not my wife, because then maybe they won't kill me in order to take you for themselves. And it says there, when the officials of Pharaoh saw her, that is Sarah, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, and for her sake he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep and oxen and male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys and camels. And so during his time in Egypt, Abram had acquired great wealth, including male and female slaves. 
but 10 years have now passed. Sarai really is getting pretty old. There is still no child of promise through Sarai. Would God's promises ever come true? And so Sarai decides to take matters into her own hand, and this is where we have the complication in the story. Because God's twice-repeated promise of a child to Sarah have not worked out over 10 years. And so right after the promise of countless children is given again in Genesis 15, Genesis 16 opens with the barrenness of Sarah, and time is moving on, so Sarah takes matters into her own hand. And she said to Abram, you see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. You might say, foolish man. Because out of that union, we have the Arab-Israeli conflict of today. And Sarah starts out by blaming God for her problems. She's hardly starting from a position of faith, is she? God has promised twice that, you're, that Abraham, you're going to have a child, and uh, you know, Sarah is your only wife. So God has promised twice that they're going to have children, but Sarah is now blaming God for the fact that she is childless. And so she decides to take matters into her own hands, and rather than looking to God for guidance, she looks to her culture. And there are many times that we today, when things don't seem to go as well as we expect them to go, we look for answers and solutions within our culture. And if it's okay within our culture, we think it's okay for us to do it as followers of God. And so she looks to her culture, and what does she find within her culture? Well, on the screen there, you see um, what was known as the Louvre Stelle. Uh, this is known as the Code of Hammurabi. Now, Hammurabi was a king in ancient Babylon, and this is the oldest known formal legal system in the world. And this goes back to a couple hundred years before the time of Abraham. And so uh, the, the Babylonians had a well-established legal system, and it's written in cuneiform text. And it is the longest, it is the best organized, and it is the best preserved legal text from the ancient world. And it is written in the old Babylonian dialect of Akkadian, allegedly by Hammurabi, the sixth king of the first dynasty of Babylon. And we may think to ourselves, well, you know, those, those ancients, they were pretty primitive. No, they weren't. Uh, that, that Louvre steel has 4,100 lines of cuneiform text on it. You can barely see them. I mean, you've got to look really hard to see they're so small. And we say, okay, but they were primitive. They're writing in cuneiform text. Well, not so, not so fast. Uh, in the English language, we have the active voice and the passive voice, yes? I see you is active. I am seen by you is passive. If you go back 2,000 years, um, languages, say ancient uh, Koine Greek, which New Testament has written, had three voices. It had active, passive, and something known as middle, where you do something unto yourself. So I see you as active, I am seen by you as passive, I see myself is middle. But if you go back to Babylonian, you have six voices. And so what, what has happened is as you go back in time, language becomes infinitely more complex. What that tells you is that as we've gone through time, we have lost the capacity for the precision of expression that they had back in those ancient days. That our languages are devolving. They're becoming ever more blunt. So if you have a language such as this, the Code of Hammurabi, that can have six voices in it, it has a capacity for precision of expression that we cannot conceive of today. And so we look at these, these stones in these museums, we think, oh, well, these ancients, they were kind of primitive, kind of scratching themselves in the dirt of the Middle East. No, these folks had a, had a, had a capacity for um, expression of thought that we simply do not have today. And that's captured in the Code of Hammurabi. Now, in the Code of Hammurabi, it allowed for a child wife, childless wife to give one of her slaves to a husband to obtain children through her. Now, the code then specified the rights of the slave girl and of the wife and the privileges and also of the child. And it did this in order to reduce jealousy, inviting, and the oppression of the slave girl. And in Genesis 12, Abraham had told Sarah while they were in Egypt that she was only to say that she was his sister and she was to deny their marriage. So effectively, in Genesis 12, Abraham had been quite willing for Sarai to have a child from an Egyptian father so now in Genesis 16, Sarah is quite happy for Abraham to have a child from an Egyptian mother. What goes round comes round, and the pain that is going to be caused is immense in both situations. So Sarah begins by blaming God for her own lack of children. Then she proposes that God give Abraham a child through Hagar. 
Sarah is going to fulfill her own needs for the child of promise with or without God. God had promised, but God seemingly had not delivered to her. Both she and Abraham are getting old. She doesn't seem particularly concerned about the seed of Abraham, the fate of Hagar, or the will of God. But she, is, is she sure this is going to be the child of promise? The text suggests not. She says, it may be. It may be. Even Sarah knows that this child may not be the child of promise. And uh, yet she still goes ahead with it, hoping that she can force God's hand in the matter. So what Sarah proposes is culturally acceptable, but it goes against God's express will for marriage. We might say, based on this story, that polygamy was never part of God's plan for matrimony. And it's only succeeded historically in bringing heartache, jealousy, and infighting wherever practiced. But today we have many versions of marriage, all of which are outside God's original plan for marriage, such as polygamy is where you have more than one wife for one man, polygyny is where you have more than one man for one wife. That, that exists in some parts of the world today. For instance, in the upper Himalayas, you have parts of, uh, parts of India and Nepal where you have multiple husbands for one wife. And why do they practice this? Because life is so hard, it's almost impossible for a husband and wife to raise a child. And so you have multiple men with one wife. Nobody knows who the father is. And then you have multiple men supporting that woman with her child. And so polygyny is the opposite of polygamy. These days, of course, we have what is known as same-sex marriage and open marriage, neither of which are in harmony with God's will. And when we ignore God's revealed will, as does Sarah in this story here, problems inevitably arise. Now, the text says that Abraham listened to his wife. And if you look at Genesis chapter 16 and Genesis chapter 3, there are multiple connections between these two stories. Genesis 3 is the story of the fall. And Genesis 16 is the story of Abraham listening to his wife, just as Adam listened to his wife. In Genesis 3 and Genesis 16, we have the same Hebrew appearing that the woman said unto, that as she took or she gave to her husband or he listened unto the voice of, they both refer to the seed and something being good in your eyes. And in both stories, God asks, when he arrives on the scene, he asks the question, where? So Sarah's scheming and Abraham's compliance echo the original sin of Adam and Eve, representing a lack of faith in God's word, an attempt to operate according to human wisdom outside of God's revealed will. Truly, Psalm 127 says this, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor build it in vain. That is the family, the house, or your home. The word there is oikos, is the household of faith in the New Testament, we get the word economy from the word oikos. So the national economy is the national household. And when a nation turns its back on God, it should not be surprised when the national economy starts to fall apart. Just as in the, our individual families, we choose to go against God's will, trouble starts. When in a nation we decide to go against God's will, um, then things start going bad. Uh, Isaiah talked about it here. He says, uh, Woe unto you, alas, you who call evil good and good evil, which is a good description of what is happening today in our nation, particularly during the holy month of June, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And so when a nation turns its back on God and calls evil good and good evil, it is no surprise that just as the individual household starts to fall apart, so the national household, the oikos or the oikonomia, that also starts to fall apart. The results are tragic. The results of, of Abraham and Sarah indicate how sin in one life, sin in one relationship, sin in one family can spread and have a ripple effect all around. But the good news of the gospel is that righteousness also has a positive multiplier effect for generations. We see that in Exodus 34, 6 through 7. So this is when God, uh, Moses asked God to show me your glory and uh, God passes before Moses, and he reveals that God's glory is actually his character. And it says, the Lord passed before him, that is, the Lord passed before Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the, the, the guilty, by visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. When you look at this verse here, it's a beautiful picture of God's grace because it is true that the sins of the parents are visited upon their children. If a man is an alcoholic and beats his wife, 
the chances are that his son, who grows up in that environment, will in the, enter into a dysfunctional marriage in his life, and he may also beat his significant other and may also be an alcoholic. Uh, the, the son is not guilty of his father's sins, but he often reflects his father's sins. And yet the, the text also says that while this may go to the third and fourth generation, God keeps steadfast love, that is covenant faithfulness or everlasting mercy. The word is chesed, maybe the most beautiful verse word in the whole Bible. God keeps chesed, that is covenant faithfulness, to the what generation? To the thousandth generation. So if sin has a ripple effect for three or four generations, righteousness has a ripple effect for a thousand generations that you can change the direction of your family and the children who have yet to be born by your life of righteousness today. How does that work out? We do not know, but God promises here that he is faithful to a thousand generations following those who are faithful to him. So I encourage you today, you can, you can affect the course of history, you can affect the lives of those who are yet unborn um, through your faithfulness to God today. But sin has a ripple effect. So the story goes on in Genesis 16. So Abram went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be, to, be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. I feel kind of sorry for Abram at that point, don't you? Like, I did what you asked, and now you're chewing me out about this? I mean, what can, what's Abraham supposed to do? Is he supposed to listen to his wife or not? If he does listen to his wife, she chews him out. If she doesn't listen to his wife, she's going to chew him out. This is obviously not a very happy marriage. Naturally, when you look at all the patriarchs, Abraham and Sarah, they don't seem to have a very happy marriage. I mean, later on in chapter 22, when God says to Abraham, get up and sacrifice your son, Abraham gets up and leaves without telling his wife because he knows there's going to be a row. Oh, where are you going this morning, Abraham? Well, I'm going to go and sacrifice our only son on a mountain over there. That's not going to be a conversation that goes well over breakfast. Then you have Isaac and Rebekah. And Isaac loves Jacob, and Rebekah loves Esau, and they start deceiving each other. And then you have Jacob, who has four wives, but he only truly loves the fourth wife. And the first wife, Leah, uh, we read the names of her boys. She has six boys to start off with. Uh, her, the names are plaintive. Maybe, maybe he will love me now. I've given him six sons. I mean, the, these patriarchs do not have happy marriages, yet they're still fathers of the faithful, you might say. And so in this story here, in Genesis 16, verses 4 and 5, Abraham goes into Sarah, and she conceives. And Hagar's status is transformed. She is now going to be a mother, maybe even of the promised seed. Maybe God's promises to Abraham, which probably everybody in the encampment knows about, maybe she's going to be the mother of the promised seed, just like later on Jewish girls were often hoping they would be the mother of the Messiah. Maybe Hagar would be the mother of the promised seed. Uh, but she's no longer willing to be treated as a slave. She's no longer willing to be passed around as a piece of inanimate meat at Sarah's whim. And so Hagar starts looked with contempt upon her mistress, the old, infertile, and bitter Sarah. And bitter strife was the result, just as a day when we ignore the divine blueprint for marriage. And that divine blueprint for marriage um, uh, excludes us from our lives things such as abuse, or pornography, or fornication, or adultery. All of these lead to pain. They lead to family breakdown. They lead to broken hearts and broken lives. So you may indulge today, but you will pay a bitter price tomorrow. And just as Adam blamed God for Eve, and Eve blamed God, the serpent to God, so now Sarah refuses to take responsibility, and she blames Abram. I kind of feel sorry for Abram at this point. Even though he's done a, a silly thing, a sinful thing, I kind of feel sorry for him. He's in a no-win situation with his wife. But Sarah sees her mistake, and she blames Abram. Because once, once sin has entered your life and your relationship, right thinking seems to go out the window, and the marriage is now being torn apart. Abram, his response, though, is awful. Abram said to Sarai, your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. Now, Abram remains utterly detached. We kind of think of Abraham, where he is called the father of the faithful. He is the hero of righteousness. He dominates the large part portion of Hebrews chapter 11. But in this verse here, Abraham is stunningly cold towards Hagar, is he not? Your slave girl is in your power. 
Abraham does not recognize his involvement in the story at all. He's utterly callous. He does not refer to Hagar as his concubine. He does not refer to her as his wife. He does not even refer to her as the mother of his child or maybe even the child of promise. In fact, he doesn't recognize his own involvement or responsibility at all. And why is this? Because as we saw in the previous verse, when sin enters a relationship, it's like descending a ski slope and hearts are progressively hardened, voices become increasingly cruel and words are spoken that should never be uttered. This is what happens when sin enters the marriage relationship. Now, the Code of Hammurabi that Sarai was operating according to the culture of her time, it regulated such situations and it prevented the, the, the cruelty to a slave concubine such as Hagar. For instance, she could not be sold and she, not, she could not be treated harshly according to the culture that is the Code of Hammurabi. But Sarah instead chooses to treat Hagar cruelly. It says there that she dealt harshly with her. And that phrase, dealt harshly with her, also appears later in Exodus 15, where God talks about the oppression of the Israelites by the Egyptians when they're down in Egypt. And so in, in, here in Genesis 16, um, we find that Sarah deals harshly with an Egyptian, and God reveals in Genesis 15 and also in Exodus 3 that when the, when the Israelites are going to be down in Egypt, the Egyptians in turn are going to deal harshly with the children of Abraham. As you might say, what goes round comes round. So Hagar is now on her own. Abraham will not defend her. Sarah is cruel to her. Eliezer is silent. God is nowhere to be found. There's nobody to turn to. Nobody will speak up for this teenage pregnant girl. What is she to do? Is she to stay within the household of faith, the household of God-fearing Abraham and Sarai, a place where she has experienced physical and sexual abuse? What is this teenage girl to do and so does she decide she's going to run away from this unhappy household of faith. And she's going to run away back to Egypt. So Hagar, in this story, she loses her home while pregnant. She loses the father of her unborn child. She lost her economic future within that household. Sarah lost her maid. Abraham lost a wife and an offspring, possibly even the child of promise. And the home is torn apart. Abraham and Sarah have chosen to mistreat an Egyptian. And years later, the Egyptians would mistreat the descendants of Abraham and Sarai. In both stories, the story of the Exodus and the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, we find oppression. And in both stories, the victim fled into the wilderness. Truly, the seed of sin can yield a bitter harvest for generations. So choose carefully how you live your lives today. There is a knock-on effect, not just in your life, but for generations to come. So how do we find the resolution to this problem? So we come to the resolution of the story here. We find the resolution beginning in verse 7. Now it says, The angel of the Lord found her, that is Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. Now uh, Hagar is fleeing back across the Sinai wilderness to the eastern borders of Egypt. I don't know if you've ever been to, to Israel or to Egypt, but if you ever go there... Um, you'll know that between Israel and Egypt, you've got the Sinai Desert and the Sinai Peninsula. It's about as inhospitable a place as you could imagine on planet Earth. It's the closest you're going to see to a moonscape. There is no water. By day, it is scorching hot. And there's no vegetation on the ground. It's just like golden rock. There's nothing there. Most places, there's no dirt. There's no sand. It's just rock. And there's nothing to see there. There's no water. And if you go out there, you're going to die of thirst, not within a few days, but within a few hours, because the heat is so intense. And Hagar is fleeing as a runaway teenage girl who's pregnant, away from an abusive family, relation, family situation. She's fleeing back to the land of her origin, back to Egypt. It's almost certain death unless she finds water. But on the way, she found a spring of water in the wilderness, which in itself you might say is a miracle if you know that part of the world. And it says that the angel of the Lord found her. It's a beautiful picture of God, isn't it? That God found that runaway teenage pregnant girl. God has a concern for teenage pregnant girls, for teenage runaways. She may have fled the household of faith where Jehovah was worshipped, where altars were set up, a household where she experienced physical and sexual and emotional abuse. And so she runs away from this household of faith and she meets God in the place she least expects to meet him, that is in the inhospitable Sinai wilderness. And it says the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water. And so we ask ourselves, who exactly is or what is the angel of the Lord? 
Well, if you read the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, and we read there that it was an angel, at least in this verse here, if you read the, the expression, the angel of the Lord, which appears multiple times in Genesis, it refers to Jehovah or Yahweh himself. And as you go through this story, it becomes clear that uh, she is talking to God, that God has found her in the wilderness here. So we're going to work on the assumption here as we go through the story that it is God who finds her. And as you, as you, look, as you study this a bit further, that uh, God says to Moses in the burning bush, I am that I am. And Jesus takes that name for himself in John 8 and John 10. So it's actually that Jesus finds her in the wilderness here. That the angel of the Lord, as you might say, is the pre-incarnate second person of the Godhead. That is Jesus Christ. And he finds her in the wilderness. Whoever this is, Hagar is not alone. It says that the angel found her. It means this meeting was intentional. In her darkest moment, God was looking for this runaway teenage pregnant girl. Nobody else was. Abraham wasn't looking. Sarai wasn't looking. Eliezer wasn't looking. The 318 trained men of, of Abraham had not been sent out to find her. She was on her own out there, but God knew where she was, and God came to find her. God was looking for her. God cared for this teenage girl. He found her, and when he spoke to her, the first words were beautiful. This is Hagar, slave girl of Sarai. Where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I'm running away from, from my mistress, Sarai. So the first thing that God says to Hagar is simply this, tell me your story. What's going on? He gives her the chance to tell her story from her perspective. Nobody else has been interested in Hagar's views. Hagar certainly didn't ask her, would you like me to have a child through you? Sarah didn't ask her. She has no mom and dad to stand up for her. Doesn't seem that anybody's concerned about what Hagar actually thinks or feels about anything, but God is. God has a concern for those who are voiceless, for those who are abused, for those who are trampled on or ignored by society or by their families. And God does not condemn Hagar here as this runaway teenage girl. Maybe polite society would look down their noses at this runaway girl. Where are you going? No, where have you come from, Hagar, and where are you going? Tell me your story. To be listened to, to be heard, to be heard without interruption, to be heard without condemnation, it is the turning point, it is the starting point of the healing process for Hagar. Hagar, the name, actually means flight. God knows her name. We see there in Isaiah 43. This is a verse you often read next to somebody when they're dying in hospital. But now thus saith the Lord, or thus, thus, thus saith the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, or O Hagar, he who formed you, O Hagar, do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk with fire, you shall not be burnt, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And I give Egypt, that is your homeland, Hagar, as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight, Hagar, and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, Hagar, for I am with you. It's a beautiful passage here in Isaiah 43 that originally God applies to his people, Israel. We see in this passage here that, that God does not, um, he treats the people of Israel, he knows them by name. Now, you know, I was in a hospital last year, and, you know, I had a procedure, and they, everywhere I go, they kept asking me my date of birth. Have you ever noticed that in a hospital? I watch your date of birth, and they put a little Coke thing on your wrist, and they kind of scan it from time to time. You're basically a, a, a biometric code to the hospital. And to the government, you're just a number. You're a social security number, yes? And they keep saying, what's your date of birth? What's your date of birth? And you're just a number to the system. You know, she asked, the nurse asked me, she says, well, are you male or female? And I said, well, what are the options? And, and she said, well, this is kind of a side story. And she says, well, I've got male and female, I said, oh, I think I'm going to be, I think I was a parrot that day. And, and then I said to her, does the surgeon know how to operate on parrot's legs? And uh, she wasn't, she was nonplussed, not quite sure how to respond. But the point is, is that to the systems of this world, you and I are just a number. But God knows us by name. And he sees where we've come from, and he sees where we're going, and one day he's going to give us a new name because he knows the ins and outs of our spiritual experience that nothing is hidden from him. And so God says to Hagar here, Hagar, slave girl of Sarah, where have you come from? 
and where are you going? He gives her the time to, to tell her story. Her name means flight, which may sound strange, but it was not at Abram's altar that she met God, but while fleeing the God-fearing household of Abram, where she had experienced her abuse. Now, God opens his, phrase, his conversation with Hagar by calling her Hagar, slave girl of Sarai. Now, God does not say Hagar, Abram's wife. He does not say Abram, uh, Hagar, Abram's concubine. He starts out by speaking the truth. Hagar, you are the slave girl and you belong to Sarah. Now, the truth may be painful, but unless there is truth in a conversation, there can be no healing. If I go to the doctor and I have a pain in my chest and the doctor says, what's wrong? I say, I have a pain in my left hand. Am I likely to walk out of that that consultation with the correct diagnosis? No. If I go to, let's say, a counselor and I'm suffering from depression and the counselor says, what are you struggling with? And say, well, you know, I think I've got two personalities. That's not going to be a helpful starting point to that conversation. Truth is essential for healing. If there is to be truth in our marriages or healing in our homes or in our marriages or in our relationships, there must be truth. It may be spoken in love, but there can, no, there can be no healing unless there is truthfulness. And so when God confronts Hagar in the wilderness, he starts out by telling her the truth, and she affirms, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah. So both God and Hagar are on the same starting point. They both recognize that she is the slave girl of Sarah. And for that is the starting point of Hagar's healing. Uh, the truth may be painful, but without truth, there can be no healing in your life or in my life. Jesus echoed this when he told this story. He says, but the tax collector, about a Pharisee and a tax collector standing in the temple, and the, and the Pharisee says, oh God, I'm grateful that I'm not like these other people. I'm not a sinner, I'm not a woman, etc., etc., etc." And he's full of himself. But then Jesus points to the tax collector, a man who's viewed as a traitor, who is probably financially corrupt, and it says, but the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So he was truthful with God. I tell you, said Jesus, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. That was the self-righteous Pharisee. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. So in this story here from Jesus, we see that truthfulness and honesty with God is essential for our own healing as well. Now, the verb to heal in the New Testament also means to save. So if we wish to be saved, if we wish to be healed uh, spiritually and for eternity, we wish healing and salvation within our marriages, a really useful starting point is to start telling the truth, to be honest about not just the other person, but to be honest about ourselves and what's really going on within our hearts and our minds. And so then the angel of the Lord says something to Hagar. He says, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. Now, this word return is used throughout the Old Testament to refer to repentance. Time and again throughout the Old Testament prophet, God says to the people of Israel, return unto me, return unto me, return unto me, turn back, turn back, turn back. This verb, it means to repent. And so, having established a common understanding, both God and Hagar recognize, I'm running away from my mistress and she is my mistress. Now God moves on to the next stage of Hagar's healing process, which is an invitation to repent. It is the first step of salvation and of finding God's path for our lives. You see, without repentance, Hagar, you are going nowhere. This is the moment of truth. Hagar, I want you to return around and go back to the household you've just fled from. If I've met you in your darkest moment, you can trust me with your future. So is Hagar going to trust God or not? If I found you in the wilderness but nobody else came looking for you, if I found you in the darkest and deepest and the most bitter moment of your life, if I found you there and I came looking for you, I'm asking you to trust me that I'm giving you a path forward that will be a blessing for you. And you may not understand it, you may not like it right now, but I'm asking you to trust me, Hagar. I'm asking you to trust me, brothers and sisters here this morning. This is the moment of truth for Hagar. She must make a decision. Will she continue fleeing to Egypt? Or will she return to, to Abraham and Sarai? Hera, according to God, Hagar is to return and submit meekly to Sarah again. Now notice this, God does not condone Sarah's treatment of Hagar. God will punish those who misuse their authority and hurt others. But he rarely entrusts this duty to those who are suffering the unjust treatment themselves. 
because the chances are you're not going to get justice, you're going to get vengeance. God does have a concern for marital relations, what goes on in a family. Later on, we read in 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, Husbands, in the same way, show consideration for your wives and your life together, paying honor to the woman as the weaker sex, since they too are heirs of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing may hinder your prayers. It's an important verse here, because if a man misuses his wife, abuses his wife, does not treat her with honor, God is not going to hear his prayers. And if a man kneels at the end of the day and says, Lord, please forgive me, but he's, in, he's continuing to engage in abuse of his wife, this text tells us God's not going to hear that confession, and that man's not going to receive forgiveness. Which means that for a man to remain in an abusive relationship with his wife, a man to be hurting his wife, not treating her with honor, he's actually living in a state of lostness, even if he goes to church every Sabbath. So if men in the congregation stay, if you want God to hear your prayers, you want God to hear your, ask your cries for forgiveness, and your confession of sin, and request for the gift of eternal life, you need to treat your wives with dignity and cherish them because they are also heirs of the gracious gift of life. You know, this is not, um, this isn't just kind of academic theology here. This is, this is brutal reality. If you want eternal life, treat your wives well and turn away from what often happens in Christian homes, which is we're all nice and polite on Sabbath morning, but there's a whole lot of abuse that takes place behind those doors Sunday through Friday. So men, hear me, hear me as I say this. If you want God to hear your prayers, treat your wife with honor. Lift her up, treat her with dignity, show consideration for her, and turn away from any abuse that you may be perpetrating upon her. Your eternal life is on the line. So we come back to Genesis 16, verse 10. Having told Hagar to go back, says the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. This is a promise to a runaway pregnant teen that she would become a great nation. It is similar to the promise given to Abraham, but this has a crucial difference. Abraham was promised that through his child of promise, all nations of the earth would be blessed. But this promise was not given to Hagar nor to her child. But God's promise to Hagar was conditional upon her obedience to his command to return to the household of Abraham and Sarai. Abraham and Sarai had forgotten if they waited and submitted to God's will, God's promises to Abraham would be fulfilled. Now, how would Hagar respond to the same test of obedience? Unlike Abraham and Sarai, she chooses, she chooses obedience to submit to God and to wait for him to work out his will in her life. And so she returns to the home of Abraham and Sarai. And likewise, we today, God gives us promises, and those promises are often conditional upon our obedience to his word. They're called the blessings and the curses in the Old Testament. But um, if we want God's blessings in our lives, we need to seek to live in the light that God has given us. We cannot ask for God's blessings if we choose willfully to ignore the light that God has given us. When God gives us a command, it comes with a promise. That promise is fulfilled as we are obedient to his command. And so Hagar goes back to Abram. The angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man with his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall live at odds with all his, with all his kin. Now, the name Ishmael means God shall hear, like I have heard you in your distress that God hears the cries of runaway teenage girls in the midst of their distress as they flee abusive situations. God hears their cries of distress and God sees them. And this is, a, this is the first child that God names in the Bible. There are a few others. There's Isaac, there's John the Baptist, and there's Jesus. This affirms that God has a profound concern for Hagar and for her unborn son at this difficult moment. And the name will be a reminder to both of them of God's providence in their lives. And it's a reminder to us today that God hears those who cry to him in their distress. It's a living witness. Names do carry a message. Now, the, the phrase, a wild ass of a man, I used to read that as a boy, and I think, that's an awful description. I wouldn't want to be called a wild ass of a man, would you? I mean, it really is an unfortunate description. Um, but that verse is used else, that word is used elsewhere in the Old Testament, particularly in Hosea and Job. There is a, des there is a desert animal known as the onager. It looks like a donkey or a mule, but it is known in the Middle East. 
for its um, fierce independence, its stubborn pride, and its untamable strength. And it's really an accurate description of the Arab nation even today. And Hagar responds with the name of God. She says, so she named the Lord who spoke to her, you are El Roy. For she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? It's a beautiful name of God. Um, In Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, God says, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians. He uses the same language as here in Genesis um, chapter 17. It tells us that God both sees and hears his children in distress. And so this name, El Roy, means the God who sees me and hears me in my distress. He sees... He hears, he knows, he acts, and he will deliver. Jehovah God is the one who sees, hears, and acts on behalf of those who trust him. He hears the cry of pain, he sees the anguish of our hearts, and he will act to deliver those who look to him. She then goes on to name the well Beer Lahai Roy, which lies between Kadesh and Beret. It's a very, uh, his name has multiple meanings, It means that the well of the one who sees and lives, or the well of the living one who sees me. This name has multiple meanings, reflecting the multiple um, ways we can look at this story. Hagar first saw a well, then God saw Hagar, and then Hagar saw God. The name is ambiguous. It invites reflection among us today on how we see God and how God sees us. And uh, we're invited in this story to see ourselves the way that God sees us, not the way that we tend to see ourselves or those around us may look upon us in our own lives. And so Hagar is obedient to God. She goes back to Abram and says, Hagar bore Abram a son. Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So clearly from this verse here, Hagar gave her testimony to Abram and Abram listened to the teenage runaway girl because he called his son Ishmael. Hagar, Abram realized that God had spoken to this runaway girl in a way that God had maybe not spoken to Abram. But uh, God had revealed himself to the girl who, who somehow didn't feel safe in his household, yet God was comfortable in her presence. And God was willing to come into her life in a very personal way. So God honored Hagar's obedience and he resolved the situation of abuse at the hands of Sarah. She shared her testimony with Abraham who joined Hagar in obedience to God in calling this boy Ishmael. And for 13 years, Abraham thinks Ishmael is the child of promise, just like before he thought Lot or Eliezer might be the child of promise until Isaac comes along. But that's a story for another day. Now, this name of God, El Roy, does not appear anywhere else in the Scriptures. But there are some verses in the Scripture that reveal what El Roy is like. The one, the God who sees me in my distress. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose heart is true to him. God is looking for people today whose heart is true to him, who are faithful to the covenant relationship that they've entered into. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all hu- humankind. From where he sits enthroned, he watches all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. It's a beautiful promise that God looks down from heaven in order to fashion the hearts, to shape the hearts of those who are faithful to him. Truly, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love to deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. And so you have this relationship here, those who fear God, those who hope in God's steadfast love, it's that same word, chesed, once again, those who hope in God's covenant faithfulness, God's eyes are upon them. Now, I don't know how you feel, but when my father was looking at me, um, it either inspired love or dread. Yes? And I'd be playing with my twin brother at the kitchen table, we'd be punching each other, my dad would look at me, and I'd know that he'd seen me, and I knew that if he'd seen me and I didn't change my behavior, I was in trouble. Anybody else have that experience? Yes. I was also stuck once going across a beach, I think I've told this sort of children's story, and I was sinking in the mud, and my, young, my twin brother ran off and found my dad, and he came, and when, when I knew that he'd seen me, and he could see me from the sand, looking out to me, stuck in the mud, peace filled my heart, because I knew that my father had his eye on me. He was going to take care of me. So it says here, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him in 2022, 
on those who hope in his steadfast love. That his steadfast love is his covenant faithfulness, and we're in that new covenant. In the heaven is your, he will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Beautiful verses then from Psalm 121. Once again, the idea is this, that God has a watch over those who are faithful to him. The eye of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. God sees the good in this earth, and he sees the evil. And as Daniel said to Belshazzar, there are heavenly watchers keeping record of everything. And one day, every evil deed will be made known, and those who are faithful to God will be vindicated before the universe, because the eyes of the Lord are in every place. So what do you say in conclusion today? Well, the psalmist wrote this, and those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. It's a beautiful promise, yes? If we know the name of God, we can put our trust in him. This name of God, Elroy, tells us that he is the one who watches over his children. He watches over his children even when society has turned their back on him. He watches over his children even when they're in the midst of an abusive situation. He watches over his children even if they're a runaway teenage girl with an out-of-wedlock pregnancy. God watches over his own. And he invites us today in these passages to put our trust in him. Because in the Old Testament, Jehovah was the pre-incarnate Jesus. It was he who sought the woman Hagar by this well, just as he later spoke to a woman at a well in John chapter 4. And just as he watched over Hagar, so he promises to watch over those who are faithful to him today. He says, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Elroy is the God who knows the past. He's with you today, and we can place our trust in him because he loves us, he is the God who sees, and he's the only God who sees into the mists of tomorrow. Elroy is the God who sees, the God who hears, the God who knows, the God who cares, and the God who delivers. So I invite you today to put your trust in him. Bow your heads with me, and we will just commit our lives to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you are the God who sees. We thank you that you see us, you hear us in our distress. You see maybe the anguish of our homes, the distress in the marriages, the cries of frustrated children. You see the paths of runaway kids as well. And yet, Father, you seek out those runaways when nobody else will. You listen to their story, you know their story, and you offer them a path to redemption. I pray, Father, that each of us in this coming week will experience you as the God who sees us, who sees our distress, who hears our cries for help, and who places each one of us on a path to redemption. Thank you, Father, that you are the God who sees, who knows our past, who understands our present, who sees in tomorrow, and therefore we can trust in you. Thank you, Father, for hearing these prayers. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.